not decide at all. No, that's again an open uh, problem. That's an open problem. Yeah, yes, it's open, but it's known, but it is known that you can prove it, it can be proven or disproven. Then it means you know, can we make all that proof? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I did, I, I, I'm not saying you can refute the disjunction of it. That's what I'm saying. The intuition is the subtle point. It is not the case that it refutes it. It's just that it affirms it. Okay? It is positively irrefutable. That I know. That's a theorem. You're going to prove that. Okay? Okay? But that's a different thing. Okay, so that is for, for sure. Okay? And, but there are plenty of propositions for which it's not known one way or the other, whether it's, true, whether it's true or can be refuted, true or false. And so it's, a, it's a undecidable. Okay? So that's the idea. So that's the, uh, I don't know a better way to explain that uh, beyond that. Yes, in the back. Go to second order, then if you put that uh, uh, for all A, if you go to a second order, if you put that for all A quantifier yeah, to the A. inside. That's what's going on here. Yeah, if you put it uh, to the inside, then it's not provable, right? Well, I don't know. I haven't so double negation of for all A, A or not A, that thing is not. Am I right? There should be the same. I think you can do it with you just four. There should be the same because you can get rid of four knots. No, because I think uh, you have the Hurkens uh, paradox or something uh, like that, and that will be fluid, but I'm not sure. that quite easily. But this is in general weaker. Okay? And we say that A is stable by definition. If and only if, this is a definition. If and only if uh, not not A implies A. Not every proposition is stable. Double negation is stable. In classical logic, when you make these general assumptions, then it is. So in particular, you can say in the presence of the law of excluded middle, then every proposition is stable. That is certainly true. Okay? So, but it is not the case in general. So, this is, but this is true. This is a, a weaker, so as in general situation, this is a strictly weaker statement when you're saying that something, uh, you know, something can't possibly be false is different from knowing that it's true. Yes, that's exactly the same. Yep. Taylor, you take care of them to the list of Taylor? I'm afraid Henry. Taylor, you take care of them to the list of Taylor? Can someone relay? Oh, uh, well, someone, okay. I'm going to leave that as an exercise as well because I'm getting tired. Okay, so here's another exercise, which is, now it starts to look kind of absurd, but it's, it is the case, but that is the case. Okay, that definitely is the case. Uh, one. 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 Yeah, one. Sorry. Yeah, one. The other way is obvious from here, but the, this direction. This is the case. Okay. The reason to, so what, what is that saying? What it's telling us is that negated propositions are stable. Okay, so that's what, a, that's what it is basically saying. Okay, and uh, I'll leave that as an exercise for you as well. These things are not hard. But we're, we're diverging. We're, I'm getting off on a tangent, so I'd rather, I'm hoping to corral us back. Why don't we leave this for the exercise section, okay, to talk about further? Okay? All right. Okay, so let me get back on my intended track. Uh, let's see. What am I going to write with? Um, okay. 
All right, so where we're, what we're doing, and all of this will make good sense, and you know, it will come together in time. Uh, what, we're, yeah. what we're doing now was talking about various notions of equality. I'll just remind you, and there's a reason why this, I want to remind you because it's very essential to what comes next. In fact, these issues of equality are completely of the essence when dealing with dependent types. So that's what we'll talk about. So let's remind ourselves. So we have this notion of definitional equality. And we explained, and I was tending, I was warning you that it's not very conventional, but I was using that notation with appropriate warnings that it's not completely standard notation because nothing is, okay? So let us say, remember this was supposed to be equality of sense or some kind of computational equality. And so uh, an example to keep in mind, I'll just write it in a form that jogs your memory. You know, for any x, sort of x plus zero is definitionally equal to x, given the definition I gave of plus. You need to know how I define plus in order to know, because it's, that's the nature of definitional equality. And then I made up a word, okay? This is completely, I made it up when I was thinking about these lectures. This is not standard, but I needed a word, which I'll call denotational equality, which is equality of reference. And so I was just writing that as equality, written like that, okay? And the example that we gave there, just to like the kind of thing that should jog your memory, is maybe with x, y, and n, x plus y is equal to y plus x, but not definitionally. And then, but not definitionally, okay? They refer to the same mapping. So if you think of this as a mapping, from n cross n, arrow n, we have two mappings. We have, if you don't mind my loose notation, uh, x plus y is one mapping and y plus x is another. What I mean is send the pair x, y to x plus y, et cetera. Okay, I have two different mappings, so I could write them like this. Okay, there's two different mappings that go there and they're the same mapping. Okay, well, why are they the same? Well, by virtue of by an argument by proof by mathematical induction. I can do a double induction. Here's two numbers. I can go all the possible cases on 0, 0, 0, successor, successor, 0, successor, successor, using the inductive hypothesis and prove, which I won't do here at the board, but you could work it out just for yourself on the basis of the definition I gave, plus, so if I take definitional equality, as I defined it, plus mathematical induction, I'll just write MI, will give you this proof that those are equal. And you can do that as an exercise as well, just, just, to, just so you know how the machine works. It's not difficult at all, it's just to see how to make the machine work. Okay? So they refer to the same map. Yes? It's an exercise in chapter one. It's an exercise in chapter one of some foundations. Oh, uh, um, no. Okay, so that's like, uh, I find this like handy, like heuristic thing to remind me which thing I'm talking about. And then we're going to have a notion of equivalence. And this is going to come up a little bit later, weak equivalence or homotopic equivalence, and this will come up later. But an example of this, it'll be a, one, the notation I'm, I'm going to use when I motivate this is going to look like that, okay? Which is, an, uh, an, an example of this would be, and this is going to be, uh, this is supposed to be homotopy equivalence or weak equivalence. And the way we're going to do, what this is supposed to mean, an example of this that we can do is the following idea. It's involved, the easiest example to motivate, there are others, but the, the most simple one you can possibly think of is uh, to think of isomorphism of sets, which is bijection sets. So an example would be that we can take 2, which is 1 plus 1, you know, true, true or true, you know, the Booleans, divided
defined using type theoretically as 1 plus 1. 2 is isomorphic to 2 in two different ways. Via the identity, and I'll just write it over here, and via the not function. Okay? Because there's not, a not is just swapping true and false, and it's as, it, it is its own inverse. Okay? And the identity leaves them alone. Okay? So we have two mappings. So we have, here's 2. Here's another copy of 2. We have this mapping, and we have this mapping, okay, which crosses them up. So these, are, these sets are going to be isomorphic, but there are two different reasons why they're isomorphic. So the way we can write that is uh, we, can, we can really say, let me, I, my, my notation was too cute, so let's write it like this, okay. If we had a type of sets, then 2 would be a particular set, it's 1 plus 1, and identity and not are forms of evidence that these are isomorphic types. That's the, the picture. So this is evidence for some kind of equivalent. I'll write it like that, sorry. And this is for equivalence. The notation is, again, not fixed, uh, but something like that is usually the way it's written, okay, looking like that. So that's evidence for equivalence. Okay, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But the thing I wanted to get across here, and this is a semi-oblique answer to a question that was asked in this morning's session, which is the idea here that uh, the, one, the thing that is going on here is that I, I have generalized this idea of equality to one of equivalence in which one has evidence for the forms of equivalence. And the thing that is going on here is that this is a particular resting point, okay, this is a particularly useful point that uh, applies to what we will end up calling discrete sets. So I think I'll wait until I explain that fully, that remark fully a little bit later. But the thing you want to see just superficially is that we state this just as a proposition, m is, m, m is equal to n colon a, just as a judgment as it is with no further evidence. The reason being that the only form of evidence is a trivial token which represents reflexivity, that these are the same map. And here we have some other forms of evidence that is other than identity or reflexivity like negation, which is a different reason why uh, two things can be considered equal. Here there's at most one thing. So the idea is that we're suppressing the trivial evidence, which is always reflexivity. And this is what is uh, related to, someone asked me about OTT, and it's related to OTT, or the identity, it's related to that, okay? So I'll come back to this a little bit later, but that's the, uh, that is the idea that's going on here. Really, this is an instance of that, in which alpha is always reflexivity. But it's customary to just focus on this, because in certain restricted low-dimensional settings, that's the way it will come out, in low dimensional settings, then this is perfectly adequate for itself. In higher dimensions, uh, it is, you need something more. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up, I'm, I'm trying to establish a framework that scales to higher dimensional type theory. That's what I'm doing. So this is a new, like a new development in the last couple of years. And I'm trying to do everything in a way that is uh, consistent with those developments. So that's the, uh, the idea about it. Okay, so why do I make such a big deal about equality? What does that have to do with anything? Well, first of all, it is an, an, an interesting question to talk about. <coughs> Excuse me, Eugene allergies. Uh, it's an interesting question to talk about uh, when two proofs are equal. But what I'm going to do with the theory of dependent types is a situation where uh, whether two proofs are equal or not is of something of prime technical importance, not merely of intellectual importance. Okay, so you can have it at the propositional level, it's just an intellectually interesting question that whether two proofs are equal and to understand when they should be equal. When we pass to the theory of dependent types, as I'm going to do now, it becomes a, something that is of technical importance and not just merely intellectual importance. Okay, so here's what we want to do. Okay, so what have I done so far, just so that we, we know? 
So what I've done so far, just to remind you yet again, we're focusing on type theory, and initially what we've done is we've set it up as a notation for proofs. But equivalently, what we can do is we can think of type theory as being a, um, um, a catalog of a variety of notions of computation. Okay, so we introduce various, types, various forms of type structure. The type structure determines the programming language features. So, for example, whether you have higher order functions am amounts to saying, do you have exponential types? Okay? Whether you have structs or tuples amounts to saying, do you have Cartesian product types? Whether you have choices or multiple classes of data corresponds to whether you have some types and so, and so forth. So, in other words, the programming language is really just a collection of types, right? The type structure determines what the language structure really is. So, what people have said is that the idea of type theory is it's a theory of constructions. It's the things you can build, your little tinker toys that you can build with to do your math or equivalently your programming. So, type theory is a theory of constructions. From that point of view, logic is an application of type theory because there are particular constructions which correspond to proofs. But there are other constructions, like of the natural numbers themselves, or of geometric objects, that don't correspond to proofs of particular propositions. They're just mathematical constructions. So what we're doing is we're interested in the general concept of what is a mathematical construction. Okay, and that's where the, uh, that's where the terminology calculus of constructions comes from, by the way. Okay, this is the origin. And in fact, uh, that's why intuitionistic logic is sometimes called constructive logic, or the doctrine is sometimes called constructivism, because Brouwer emphasized the idea of a construction in the sense I'm describing. And in fact, Brouwer's dictum is the uh, idea, the principle that mathematics, rather than mathematics being sort of a further development of logic, that is mathematics builds on logic, that it's the other way around, that logic is just a particular corner of mathematics. And I would say, from a modern perspective, actually it's just a particular corner of computer science because math itself is just a corner of computer science. <laughs> okay? No, that's the idea. Because computer science is based on the idea of constructions in computing. And Brouwer's point was you can build all of mathematics on the idea of construction, which is the idea of computer program. So really, it's all computer science. Okay? Computer science is the, the, the queen of sciences, if you ask me. Okay? <laughs> It used to be people thought it was math, but it's not, okay? It's actually computer science. So that's the, uh, that's the, the, the thrust of what we're, what we're trying to do here in talking about uh, intuitionistic logic. And this is the reason why I, I have the point of view that the structure of programming languages is not up for grabs, okay? It's a matter of scientific discovery. It's not like, oh, whatever, you know, some guy or gal somewhere who's very charismatic comes up with some crazy ass thing and therefore it's good. Okay, that's like not what we're, what we're about. Okay, so it's like a different perspective on, on what, uh, what programming languages are about. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've set up, well, propositional logic. So these are kind of elementary constructions, various kinds of constructions. So these types. So what we have is the empty type zero, we have one, we have uh, A cross B, A plus B, A arrow B, okay, which in logical terms are false, true, conjunction, disjunction, and implication, okay. So this is what we have so far and all the terms associated with it. So that's a good bit of stuff. But now there's going to be some other stuff. And the thing that I want to talk about here is the notion of uh, the notion of family of types. Okay, this is, this is critical. And what this is, is this is, uh, you can think of it as a, a formulation of or a generalization of, well, so you can think of it as a generalization, really, of the concept of a predicate or a relation as it comes up, okay? So, for example, <coughs> if we look at the elementary property of a number x being even, okay? And in fact, to <coughs> be emphatic about it, 
that's right. Let's assume we have the natural numbers around. I haven't gotten yet to talking about how we do that. Okay, but we can say <coughs> there's a proposition, even of x. The uh, proposition is even. The idea is I want to think of this as a propositional function. So this can be thought of as a predicate. That's the usual way to think about it. But because we're in a constructive setting, it's not a predicate. So this is like another pernicious, annoying thing that people do, okay? which is because they equate the idea of a proposition with the idea of a Boolean, they therefore equate the idea of a predicate with a function that returns either true or false. This is as wrong as wrong can be. It's just wrong. So things like assert statements in C or something like this, that's a, like, that's a very, it's an abusive use of the terminology. <coughs> because what they are is there's a difference between a function that returns a Boolean and a proper predicate. I'll come back to that later. So this can be thought of as a predicate, it can, right? That's the usual thing. But it can also be thought of as a propositional function, all right, propositional function. Because you can think of this as describing a mapping. Just make that be a big, long arrow. For every x in n, even of x is a proposition. It's, a, it's something that yields a proposition when applied to a number. So it's a propositional function. So I write it like that so you can see that clearly. Or another way to say it is it's a family of types. In this case, indexed by n. And that's the interesting one because we can think of it, another notation for that, I'm not really going to use this, but you can look at it like this. Even of x is a prop, it can be thought of as a family for every x in n. That's some sort of, you know, familiarish looking notation for the same thing for what I've written over here. Okay? Now, <clears throat> why is this an important or interesting idea? Why is this perspective interesting? Well, it's because of the props as types principle. Remember, the idea of something being true is identified with having an inhabitant. Truth means I have a proof. A proof is an object, so having a proof, uh, an element of this type. So I can have, I can say, uh, <coughs> you know, I can make uh, uh, statements about when certain numbers are even, okay? And I can uh, maybe generically in X under some additional conditions about X. And the, uh, the idea will be, okay, so the idea is that when I do that, what I am doing is I am exhibiting a family of types in that if you give me every, any particular choice of number, it's going to give me back a proposition which has inhabitants or not. So for example, even of three will be uninhabited. That's what we're going to say. You won't be able to find a term of that type, assuming I gave a definition of even. I didn't actually do this so far. I'm roughing out the general plan. Even of two will, will be inhabited. That will be an example. And in general, we're going to have an infinity of propositions going across here, expressing the evenness of the, each of the natural numbers all the way across. So these are all indexed by the natural numbers. So this is over zero goes to here, uh, one goes to here, uh, two goes to here, and so forth. Okay. There's another way to think about this, another way to think about this diagram, okay, is to think of it as um, a big kind of fat sum over here. And what we do is we isolate what are called the fibers over each number. So the idea is that what we do is we look here, and what this is, is you can think of this as the big, I'm going to use a, a notation which I'll define later, the big sum of even. The idea is that in this picture that I'm drawing, what I will have at any spot is a number, okay, together with a proof, let's call it P, uh, that that number is even. And if that number isn't even, there won't be such a pair in it. So if I pick any number here, okay, like let's say two down here, I can look at all of the slice, this little slice, this is called, this is called the fiber, okay, I can look at the fiber over two consists of all the pairs of the form two comma something. Okay, are written like that. And that corresponds, that fiber corresponds to 
the instance of this family corresponding to x being equal to 2. And if I want to look at the instance of the family corresponding to x being 3, it'll be that fiber, and there'll be another fiber all the way over for each of the numbers, whichever ones we want. In some cases, the fiber, the picture is a little misleading because the fiber will be uh, empty. There will be none. Okay? There's no reason why it has to have any particular size. But the intuition is, is that you look at the, this big so-called total space, okay? And then you look at the things that project down, in this case by the first projection, that project down onto a particular number. And all the ones that project down are to be thought of as sitting on top of each other. They're in the same vertical dimension. So there's one, one here, and one here, and one here, and one here, and one here. Maybe there are none, okay, but however they are. These are all the things of the form 4 comma p, and they all sit above 4. So that's called the fiber over 4. So that's another way to think about what a family of types looks like. So it's a propositional function, it's a family of types, or as this terminology goes, it's a vibration. Okay? That's another, another way to think about it. So people will describe, even in this kind of context, they'll describe it as a vibration. When they describe it as a vibration, this is what they have in mind. Okay? This is the kind, the kind of picture that they have in mind. Okay? Uh, all right, that's going on. So these are just different ways of thinking about the same concept. Now, the reason that this that equality is so important in this setting is because of the principle of what should be called, func uh, which is called functionality or functoriality, <coughs> or respect for equality. So functionality equals respect for equality in various senses. This is the central notion, and the idea is this, is that if in some A I have B, which has, let's little, put a little X there to indicate it varies with X, is a type, it's written like that. And if you give me, so one, well, there are various things we're going to write down. So first thing we'll write down is this. And if you give me M, which is of type A, then you can form an instance, M for X, B, you know, B sub X, we'll go in here, is going to be a type. So that's the first thing. So the idea is if you have a predicate over a domain, all right, that's one, one, way, one way to think about this, because you have a family of types indexed by a type, so it's a predicate over a domain. If I have an instance of this domain, then that predicate can be specialized to that particular instance. But the functionality condition says more. It says if you have such a thing and you give me equal, and now here's the issue, certainly definitionally equal things, that's a starting point, then I will know that the instances are definitionally equal. So that's the first principle. So we get the notion of definitional equality of types. So in the case of evenness, you see, uh, now that we have the idea that an ordinary, that is a variable ranging over a type, can occur within a type, well, this is a prop or a type, you know, that I use them interchangeably at the moment, then the idea is that um, you have this variable that can occur in here. So if I give you definitionally equal instances, then they are going to be definitionally equal types. And the importance of being definitionally equal types is that typing respects definitional equality. Okay, so I assume you've written this down. So let me write down a few, a few things now that we're, we're starting to establish some fairly large machine now. So let me try to be careful about writing everything down properly. So we're going to have the idea of gamma being a context. We're going to have the idea of definitionally equivalent context. We're going to have the idea of a family of types indexed by gamma. And we're going to have the idea of definitionally equivalent types, <coughs> families of types. And we're going to have the idea of an element of the type and the idea of definitionally equivalent elements of that type. This is the most basic setup that we need. Okay? So this is the framework. 
the most important thing here at the moment is definitionally equal types classify the same elements. So let's write B here, A, if A is equivalent to B. This is important. Okay? So definitionally equivalent types classify the same terms. So if you can show that two types are definitionally equivalent, then if you have a term one type of the one type, then you also have a term of the, the exact same thing is a term of the other type of B. Okay, so that's a that's a, a central principle. Now, I haven't told you what exactly are the principles of definitional equality of types other than by a substitution. So there are substitution principles going on. So for, and I use them uh, here. Okay, so I used it here. When I substitute for X, I get a type out of the particular instance. So in general, right, we're going to have sub substitution rules that look like this. With X is in A, if I know that B is a type, then I know if M is in A, it's related to this thing, then I know that M for X, B, is a type. Those are instances. Okay. Uh, I have a question because I don't really understand. Type is a, is a particular type? No, it's just a judgment saying this is a type. Like early on, I said something is a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm now doing everything in type speak. Okay, I can do it in prop speak if I want, but I'm, I decided to settle on constructions as the central notion, and so I'm doing everything using type terminology. Okay. okay. So we have basically two, two different kinds of judgments. We can say that. Yeah, there are three kinds of judgments. Something is a context, which I haven't fully explained yet. Uh, one is a type, A is a type, and M is a type A. Okay. Plus, there are associated definitional equivalences. Okay. So these are important. But I was trying to motivate them by like of this predicate. And then the other rule, I won't write it again, is this rule. So this rule. So that rule is this, this rule. And then this rule as well. So if you wanted to really write it out fully, it says if you have a family of types B indexed by A, and if M and N are definitionally equal uh, index elements, then the types you get back are definitionally equal. Uh, that should be B. And therefore, by this rule, they're interchangeable as classifiers. So somehow everything is driven by that particular rule. Okay, so that starts to be the beginning. This is the beginnings of it all, okay, of, of the idea of dependent types. Now, I haven't, I sort of acted like even was a primitive notion. In fact, it'll be definable, but it, it needs a little machinery that I, of inductive definitions that I don't have yet. So I'm going to be a little loose about exactly which are the things, except in one case, which is uh, coming up next. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll do that. I'll talk about the identity type. Okay, so let me check for a minute what's going on here. I want to make sure I say the right thing here. Right, okay. I have to figure out the right moment to bring this in. Okay, so this is the general theory. And so the, my, my first point is, as soon as you have the idea of family of types, so this is expressing the idea of a family of types, because Gamma is, what is gamma? Gamma is a bunch of declarations of variables. So gamma generally has the form x1, a1 through xn, an. So that's the notation. I, I mentioned that before up here. Okay, so that's the idea. So what this says is that this is a family of types indexed by the variables in gamma. So we have, as I mentioned, if x, so let's do another one. Let's say if x, y, or an n, those are two variables then maybe x less than or equal to, and I'll just write the n on there just to be, or I'll put it over here. It doesn't matter where I write it. Let's put it here. Okay, is going to be a type. So that is a, an example of a relation. A relation is a two-argument propositional function or uh, a family of types indexed by two variables, right? For every choice of x and every choice of y ranging over n, I get back a type the type of proofs 
that x is less than or equal to y for that particular choice of x and y. Okay? That's what's important. So the thing that I'm trying to inculcate in you is to stamp out your Boolean prejudices, okay? Predicates don't stand for like a Boolean. That's like, you have to undo that thought, okay? A predicate is a family of types. And what you do is when you instantiate it, what you get back is a classifier, which is the, the classification of all the proofs of that instance of the family, okay? So from this being a predicate, I will know therefore that three less than or equal to seven is a type. It's the type of proofs that this number is less than that number. Okay? This is the way you must think constructively. There's no other way. Okay? You must think in those terms. As soon as you start getting used to that, then a lot of things will make, uh, will make more sense to you. And in fact, the, the power of this thinking is, is uh, to be quite honest, uh, breathtaking. In the, in, the, in the course of my career, I've had some of the most astonishing experiences that are kind of hinge on this kind of constructive perspective. So I think that is uh, the thing to get across. Okay, so you're with me so far on that? Okay, so three less than seven is not a Boolean. It's a type. All right, <coughs> so, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So there's another type. Let me just erase because I don't know where I'm from. That's also a type. Which will not be inhabited, okay? You won't know a proof of that type. Therefore, thought of as a proposition, you will not be able to say that it's true. Okay, so that's the idea. Yeah, so it's the inhabitation of the type. I mean, that's the thing that matters because this goes back to my basic principle of true means I know a proof. Equivalently, that the type associated